It's a pleasure to be here at Old Trafford today, Theatre of Dreams. Um, I'm, the, yeah, I'm the service business manager currently for the UK CyberSoc uh, within Secure Data, part of Orange Cyber Defense. Um, and just to touch on that for a second, uh, just to kind of put it into context. So the UK CyberSoc is uh, effectively uh, not so much, we, we call them socks and cyber socks. Massive differentiation there. The, the difference with the CyberSoc is we're doing more of the activities that look at the, the data, security analysis, incident response, threat intelligence, all of the kind of stuff that comes out of security devices. Our traditional SOCs are more kind of doing traditional managed services. So we have an, all, an all amazing amount of data that, that, that comes out of that. For those of us that are familiar, I guess, with secure data from the past, you know, there's, there's a, a greatly expanded picture now. A lot of what I'm going to talk about today, though, is, is kind of research that we've done um, over the past few years, kind of before we've had access to a lot of this expanded data. Um, and I'm going to talk later on actually about more data isn't necessarily better data, it's, it's about what you actually do with it when it comes to threat intelligence. And we're going to start with touching on a theme that, that actually that Helen touched on, kind of remote code execution, web-facing platforms and their exploitation. Um, still something that is just so common and, and the information really is out there for us to understand what is out there and, and what is exposed. Um, we took this um, Webmin, a platform used by many to manage uh, Linux and, and Unix systems, and, and looked for basically a simple uh, web-facing exploitation, remote code ex execution, and looked to see, you know, where was it present? Um, and again, this is just simple to do, using Showdown and things like that, to look at where that vulnerability might be present by looking at the versions that, that web services are, are running. And, you know, we, felt we looked at UK and South Africa, that's where a lot of our research people are, so just, just a small kind of experiment to understand you know, the exposure, just for this one web-facing vulnerability. And you can see like, the exposure there with, with you know, four sets of results from four different vulnerabilities that we were looking for. Um, amazing, that, the, the, you know, that many that are out there, and this is just the tip of the iceberg, really. So that's, you know, that's just four vulnerabilities. What about all of the vulnerabilities that exist that are you know, web-facing? And you know, people have talked, Equifax is kind of old news now, but you could replace this with a new news story about the latest cybersecurity breaches. You know, we're seeing things every week now. And the common thing that doesn't seem to change is kind of some of the words I've that have been highlighted in bold here. So vulnerability, patch available, you know, more than two months. Two months is actually you know, a short time period in this example. Sometimes, you know, much longer than that, but the company has had the time to, to patch these things. Um, so why, why are we so bad? You know, why... You know, and the problem is we, we're dealing with just this massive landscape that keeps changing, new vulnerabilities being introduced. Um, we're introducing new systems and, and new platforms all over the place. You know, we're starting to use cloud digital transformation. It's, it's changing the way that businesses work. Everything is going more online now, which means our risk exposure is, is massively increasing. And when it comes to the number of vulnerabilities that we see both inside and outside of our organization, we can get visibility. But how do you deal with so many, how do you prioritize? And that's where, you know, we talk a lot about intelligence-led security. And, and the thing about threat intelligence, the, the, you know, the kind of point of it is, is to predict the methods and actions of our adversaries. We, we're often looking at, you know, what will the attackers do? Taking that kind of attacker's eye view of things. And I think, you know, there's a lot of kind of stock um, that is placed in that. A, a lot of people have kind of used that to try and lead their strategy. Something I'm going to talk about later, there's another talk that maybe goes into a bit more uh, about this later on, given we've only got 15 minutes, but we did some experiments with some traditional kind of IP block lists, for example. And we're looking at, basically, when would these IP block lists, uh, would, would they re-offend some of the IPs that we were looking at? What was the percentage where we'd see uh, an IP address from one of these lists, and then within a period of six months, will we see it again? And actually less than 4%. So we're looking at some of this information that is being sold to us as being highly effective, and actually it's not. So where can we intelligently use threat intelligence? There's also the, the kind of, um, you know, going back to that earlier example, you know, we can make it more difficult for attackers by fixing the critical vulnerabilities that matter. We do a lot of penetration testing, a, a lot of penetration testing. And we found that, um, again, we, did, we looked at uh, uh, the data from across all the penetration that we, uh, testing that we've been doing and saw that you know, we were likely to find a critical vulnerability 
on average, within 3.3 days, on the, you know, looking across the amount of time it took across all the tests that we did. When we do a retest, that time went up to 21 days. So actually, when people would implement what we'd found, you know, that made it much you know, seven times potentially more difficult for attackers to, to find that path, that, that exploit that was there. So it's a, you know, it's a, it's a similar message. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about you know, today comes from Secure Data Labs. That is the research arm of the business. They're looking at all of the data that we produce. They actually take a lot of data from more of the defensive side, from our vulnerability management teams, from our managed threat detection teams. And you know, this kind of old proverb of know thyself, know thy enemy is, is quite relevant here because, we, again, we've spent a lot of time focusing on you know, look, what the attackers are doing, what the cyber criminals are doing. But actually, we need to refocus on ourselves. You know, where, where are we vulnerable and how can we use that outside information intelligently to, to divert our resources to the right places? Um, so yes, we have to observe the landscape and, and, and look at that. You know, a lot of what we do is, is a complex process of taking in all of this data, collecting data, correlating it, triaging it, analyzing it when we're looking at you know, some of the mind threat detection stuff that we do. But actually out of that, looking at that data as a whole kind of set of data and strategizing about where we can actually use that data to measure some of our theories from research. Again, there, there was a lot of, hey, we've got all this data. You know, you'll see a lot of security vendors talking about we we see 12 million uh, pieces of malware a day and things like that. But they're not actually using that data and taking it back into the process and feeding it back into research to measure that. Um, and then starting that process again. So that's, that's some of what, we, what we're trying to do here to, to really bring, bring value. Um, and with that, you can then look at measurable change and look at the way that, you know, with that example, is IP intelligence useful to us? How useful is it? How much time and money should we put into that side when potentially, for example, um, honeypots and, and deception wow. techniques might be a bit more effective. So it's important for us that, that everything we do is, is research-led. And, and again, we've got this kind of this threat landscape, right? And a lot of us, you know, this is an old message. Uh, I'm sure most of you know. We talk a lot about, yes, protect your systems, invest in that. But also, you know, assessing where potentially those extra attack services, where their extra vulnerabilities might be, um, you know, detecting and responding to threats. The important bit is that this attack surface is probably larger than most companies think. I think this is one of the things that we find. When we talk about finding those, you know, those web-facing systems in particular, um, we don't necessarily know everything that's going on. This is this kind of shadow IT problem that we've got. It's easier than ever before to just establish new systems with cloud computing online. So it's important to know where that attack surface is uh, and, and bring that into this whole kind of program. And I, I think a lot of us are still trying to get that program going of being able to you know, prevent, detect, respond, to kind of measure our progress, to understand risk. But unfortunately, at the same time, there is this massively growing attack surface that we're looking at. Um, and and <laughs> it's this old thing in cybersecurity about the castle and how it's not, you don't just put your walls around your network anymore. Um, that maybe people can move in inside and outside of the network, obviously. Um, you know, with these kind of, this expanding attack surface, expanding digital risk that we're carrying now, you know, it's almost like people are building, you know, the, the hidden, hidden tunnels under the castle. Uh, you know, there, there is just this vast amount of stuff that we, that we don't know about. So some key points that we're really focused on at the moment and that we believe that, that you should all be focused on. First of all, know your footprint knowing what's out there. And that, that isn't just looking at your web-facing systems. You know, Helen mentioned social media as well. You know, that is a, another vector for, for attack. It's another place where we can pick up interesting and useful information. Um, looking at your exposure of, of data, you know, being able to understand where the documents might be leaked, often accidentally. And again, you know, one example is Amazon S3 buckets, which you know, has now been a bit more locked down. But to start with, you know, a, a massive amount of, of files were exposed um, via that, uh, that method. But also, you know, looking at open FTP shares, um, people's home NAS drives, you'd be just amazed at some of the stuff that we found in our research on this topic. You know, finding pen test results, a uh, contractor who's been at six different banks in the last 12 months and has gone home, backed his machine up to his uh, home NAS drive, which was open to the internet, where we could just go in and see all of the stuff that you've been working on at all of these organizations. This is the kind of digital footprint that we have now. 
It is, it is far huger than you think. So in that, you know, needing to understand the threat model, when we're, we're looking at, you know, defending against these things, it, it's important to, to take that context and understand what's that attack surface, who is likely to be attacking us, and where can we possibly detect threats. And not just, you know, there is, I, I see an awful lot still of people wanting to throw logs into a SIM, for example, and, and do some kind of correlation, like it's some sort of magic. It just doesn't work like that. You have to do proper threat modeling, and you have to, you have to, you have to go on that journey and work with the business. Um, knowing your vulnerabilities is, seems like an obvious one, but also, again, no, knowing where they are. And also prioritizing. Using, you know, we have much more freely available risk information around vulnerabilities now. Are they actually being exploited? Uh, you know, I think it's somewhere around 2% of vulnerabilities are only ever exploited. So immediately you can cut out a vast majority of some of those vulnerabilities, even the critical ones, uh, or at least lower the risk profile of those versus the ones that are uh, like the ones I showed at the start, that are out there, they are easily exploitable, um, and they, they exist. Know how you react on the result, you know, incident response planning. Um, it is cyber specific. We have to think about that. Um, I still come across a lot of organizations who are doing, it's kind of bucketed into general incident management. Um, and again, there are resources out there, free resources like the ones that Helen talked about. Um, Organizations like ourselves who can, you know, without a lot of time and money, can at least help you get to that base level of understanding of um, an incident response plan that is cyber-specific, help build basic playbooks from the common from the threats. Um, and also knowing that something happened and, and what happened. And this is really, you know, going back to that network of cyber socks, this is kind of what we do. You know, being able to, to have that visibility 24-7 of when attacks get through, where they are, and, and, and what to focus on. And most importantly, I think, knowing what, what you're going to do next. Taking all of this um, and, and you know, forming a strategy, working with, with people that are prepared to invest time in that, and, and understanding you know, what is our, our strategy, and not just what are the projects we have, but, but what does that look like in the bigger picture, and how is the business affecting how that picture looks? How is that attack surface expanding? I think that's one of the important things to look at. In summary, um, you know, we, we do face these overwhelming odds. So, it's not easy. <laughs> I've talked about a lot of kind of basics, but then they're, they're not basics because they're not easy. And we, we haven't done them yet. We haven't done them properly. So we, we have to work on that. Um, Intelligence-led security can, if applied properly, tip, help tip the scales in our, in our favor. But if applied properly, it's, it's about understanding why we're using that intelligence and what we're using it for. Um, and again, about understanding ourselves and our own footprint, you know, using the ability and, and, and tying intelligence into that. Um, and we have to understand this, this attack surface. I've, I've said it a few times. We have to understand what that is and, and where it is. Um, it's not a commodity, you know, threat intelligence. Some very small portions of it, like IP threat lists and things like that, are a commodity. But again, we, we kind of talked about how, how they're kind of limited usefulness. Um, vulnerability data is absolutely key. You know, we talked about the ECFAS breach and, and how pretty much in every major breach, there was a vulnerability that, that was left unpatched that, that was really the, the, the way in there. Uh, and I think I still see that, that that's something that is either not being done, or if it is being done, it's being done ineffectively. And, and people are struggling with the amount of vulnerabilities that they're finding. So let's find new ways to prioritize that, take more of a risk-based approach than a volume-based approach. You're never going to get rid of all your vulnerabilities. They're just too many. Um, and also, you know, having that, that kind of um, approach that, that, that gives you the ability to, to switch focus very quickly, because attackers will. Um, and just a, you know, the shameless plug, the one shameless plug in the, in the organization is that, you know, we do help with this. Um, this is something we, we do within the cyber so We kind of fill that skills gap, um, that resourcing gap, and also, you know, the kind of process. It, it, it's taken us years to build the, the processes that are mature enough to help customers do this without flooding them with useless information. Um, but really, it, it, it's about you know, having somebody who's going to start at the basics with you and not try and start over here with some new exciting tool or some new exciting service and actually help come in and understand. Um, we, you know, we have to start with those basics because I think often we get dragged into things that are new and shiny. Technology vendors often lead us down that path. Unfortunately, they're just doing their job, unfortunately. But you know, we, we have to, you know, that's the way we have to approach it. So, I am going to talk more later on, perhaps, about some of the research that, that kind of backs up some of this stuff. Uh, so I'm back here at 11.25. If you'd like to hear more, then please come with and, uh, and see me then. Um, but yeah, um, 
pleasure to be here at Old Trafford, as I said, the theatre of dreams. Not for me, I'm a Liverpool fan. It's often been the theatre of nightmares. Um, but you know, things aren't so bad at the moment. So uh, <laughs> if I don't get kicked out for that, I will see you at 11.25. Grant, thank, thank you. you very much indeed.